this place. It isn't what you think. you hope and give you more time if you help me so what's it gonna be Peyton hello how are you today sir genuinely how are you doing today I'm, I'm doing well how are you I'm doing very well. I'm excited to talk to you about this film. I want to get into it. I saw it last night. I had a very good time with it. I just, I want to know when they come to you and they're like, all right, Peyton, you're the guy. You're going to kick off phase five for the MCU. What is that like initial feeling in you? Is it like, oh God, or like, what What was the thought there? I think the feeling is, you know, listen, we got to make a third Ant-Man movie. And, and my thing from the very beginning as we were formulating the story, which I think it's been almost three years ago, we started, you know, working on the screenplay. Uh, was to really, we wanted to do something different for this third one. And we wanted to go bigger and we wanted to answer some of the questions we set up in the first two. And the biggest one was about the quantum realm and Janet Van Dyne, Michelle Pfeiffer's time in the quantum realm. So that was really what led the charge. And I also, you know, I said to Kevin Feige, let's put Ant-Man and the Wasp up against one of the Mount Rushmore villains from the Marvel comics, uh, Kang the Conqueror. And can we figure that out? And, and we did. And I think the phase five of it kind of came about after that fact, right? It was like, well, here we have Kang the Conqueror and, you know, the idea that Kang is a powerful villain in and of itself and Kang the Conqueror is the most feared of the Kangs, but he has variants, right? There are other versions of him in different timelines. Um, that was always appealing to us. When we cast Jonathan Majors in that role, um, I had been a fan of Jonathan since I think I saw him in Hostels, you know, with Christian Bale years ago. Um, and he had a very small role in that movie, but you could not take your eyes off of him. And as I got to know Jonathan, we talked, you know, this was all during uh, the pandemic and we were having Zoom meetings and kind of talking about this character and how we dimensionalized this character from the comic books. Um, we really landed on a lot of things about this character and it, we both got very, very excited about it. And I got excited about putting that Jonathan Majors energy up against Paul Rudd's Scott Lang energy. That seemed like an exciting thing. It was an exciting thing. It was such an exciting thing to watch. And I, I'm glad that you bring up Kang because you knew I was going there next with so many versions of him, right? Because that seems like both a director and an actor's just kind of dream is to like take this character and do him in a bunch of different ways. So what kind of conversations did you have with Jonathan Majors about what you wanted this Kang to be? And obviously we meet some of those variants very briefly, but like what kind of conversations happened there between you and Majors? Well, Jonathan had briefly played a variant called He Who Remains in the last episode of Loki, yes. which is a very different character. He was almost uh, John the Baptist foretelling the coming of Jesus. And that, <laughs> but John, we talked a lot about Jonathan. He wants to do the research and he wants to, he wants to really dig into this character. And we talked a lot about what would it be like to be in the presence of someone who doesn't live in a time, a straight timeline of past, present, and future. He lives many different timelines and these time loops and in different universes. And we talked about sort of if you had that much experience and then you come into contact with sort of a, a more normal human being who lives in a straight line, there's almost a slight condescension to how he deals with with Scott. And there's a an economy of words and an economy of movement because he takes time very seriously. And when something comes out of Kang's mouth, he means it. Right. He doesn't waste words. And then we talked about trauma and what happens to someone if they've experienced multiple traumas and multiple timelines. How does that affect them as and, and really leaning into that sort of the side of of that antagonist that could be relatable? I think always the best villains are ones that even though, you know, they're bad, you maybe understand why they're doing what they're doing and maybe even have a little bit of empathy for that person. And we like the idea of in our movie, we had this opportunity to explain kind of some of the things Janet had been doing down there in the quantum realm and the fact that they had come into contact, they have a past and that past did not work out too well for either of them. And that felt fun to sort of, she's trying to put that behind her and not talk about it. She's never told the family about it. But uh, as we know uh, that, you know, you can be done with the past and it's not done with you. And that, that seemed like a really, you know, really fertile dramatic ground for us. 
Absolutely. So here's the question then, because the rule, the rule of thumb at this point with the MCU is if you don't see a body, you can't count someone like totally dead. So I'm going to pose this to you. If you can confirm for me, like, can we get it on the record that the Kang we meet in Quantum Mania is he dead now? Is he dead and gone? Well, I think that's the real question. I think you see Scott Lang struggling with that question, uh, uh, you know, uh, and and I think it's, uh, you know, I didn't actually know that that was a hard, fast rule that if you don't see the body, that doesn't mean they're gone. <laughs> um, but I think Kang or the Kang variants are going to be a presence. I mean, in this whole phase five, there is a movie coming out called Avengers Kang Dynasty. What does that mean? I'm not sure. I'm not doing that, but we'll find out. But to me, it was all about Kang the Conqueror and coming up against these heroes and sort of, you know, them preventing him from getting out of the quantum realm. See, this is how I know you're experienced in Marvel because you know how to sidestep giving a definitive answer on that one, Peyton. I like it. You I don't do. really want an answer to that question. You don't really want an answer to that question. I mean, I really you kind of you do, do, though, but, but you it's, don't. I, it's... <laughs> well, I also I do want to ask because one of the things I loved most about Quantum Mania is just like we're getting back to Papa Lang, like the dad energy, the relationship, the dynamic between Scott and Cassie. I love seeing Catherine and Paul together. Tell me about kind of crafting that aspect of the movie because that's pivotal. That's what that's Scott's whole motivation at this point. Yeah, the the Scott Cassie relationship has always been the spine of the Ant Man movies, and it's this whole thing of you know Scott Lang trying to find work life balance. He he yes he's an Avenger, but he also his his biggest priority is being a good father to his daughter. And the events of Endgame gave us this unique situation where he'd lost another five years with her. She's no longer a little girl, she's a young woman. And she's finding her voice as a young woman and as a, a potential hero. And her ideas of justice and uh, you know being a hero and doing good in the world are different than her dad's. And that felt like a logical progression of that relationship. You know, She's at the age where she's quite critical of her father. And, you know, why are you sitting around signing books? You're an Avenger. Get out there. Do something. There's plenty of more injustice, you know. Um, at the beginning of the movie, she rattles off all of these things that, that are of concern to her in the world. Um, we like the relatability of that. And when we were looking at who would be this 18-year-old Cassie in the movie, I, you know, I'd seen so much of Catherine Newton's work, and she just is this bright spark. She's just a, a, such a bright presence. And we needed someone who could really hang with Paul Rudd and and sort of like give and, and go back and forth with him comedically and dramatically. And I also think, you know, Abby Ryder Fortson, who plays our, our young Cassie in the first two movies, you know, for me, it's like we had to be very careful with that casting because you want to know that she grows up well and fulfills the promise of, you know, what, what you see in, in, in Abby in those first two movies. So Catherine came in and just, you know, had this rapport with Paul that was crucial to the movie. And, um, you know, she's so gifted dramatically and comedically that uh, I I'm, I'm thrilled with her performance in the movie. Me too. She is the coolest. Peyton, that is my time. But thank you again so much for speaking to me today. Thank you for this movie. I can't wait to see what you do next. But congratulations on this, man, for real. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. All right, let's cut.